I'm sure, like my wife, and as you saw the tie, some of your wives are probably already decorating the house. In fact, Anne has already done her beautiful job as always decorating the church. Always a beautiful thing that she has for us. Well, recently I was reading a story. It was a funny story about a police officer um, named Brian. He, he was found this nice hiding place on the road uh, to catch uh, people speeding down the road. And as he was waiting there, normally he catches a lot of people there. And he noticed all the drivers were slowing down like 10 miles per hour slower than normal. And he scratched his head, why, what's going on? Normally this is a hot spot. Why, why aren't these cars speed on by? And so eventually he does, he does a little investigating and he finds this, nine, this 10 year old boy named Dennis who is standing in front of the road just a little past him saying, uh, radar trap ahead. So all the cars are slowing down. He does a little more investigation, goes down the road a little further and he sees his, his accomplice saying, uh, donations accepted here. Neil as a cop found this nice little bucket of cash there. Now I like investigation stories, some that are more humorous like this, but there are some fun investigation stories. Uh, I, I like watching the show Columbo like with my dad. I like watching Sherlock Holmes. Uh, I don't know if you guys ever watched this TV show called Monk, he was a little eccentric detective. And another a detective named Castle, actually he was a writer, and Beckett was the detective. But I, there's something about stories about investigators that are seeking the truth. They're going to look for the truth, and there's a fun mystery along the way. That's often how life is. You, you have a mystery. You're looking for it. And not only are you looking for a mystery, but you're thinking, what's the meaning and purpose of life? What does God have for me? What does he want for me? And today we're going to look at a particular spot about looking and investigating the truth in 1 Peter chapter 10, uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, 10, verse 10 to 12. And I'll just read it for you real quick here. So 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 10. Concerning the salvation, the prophet who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, make careful searches and inquiries, inquiring to know what time or what kind of time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as you were predicting the suffering of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. And these things you now have been declared to you through those who proclaim the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent for him things in which angels long to look. May God bless our reading of God's word and as we go through it today. Uh, today we're going to continue our journey in the book of Peter in our series Standing Firm. Uh, wrong one. <laughs> Standing firm uh, uh, in grace. And today we want to look at this particular part where it says, reveal the word, the real word of God, the revealed word of God in 1 Peter 1, 1, 10 through 12. And we want to look at four, five things. You can go ahead. let's try this. Ooh. Hey, it's working. We're going to five things. The prophet, the message, the audience, the author, and the mystery. The prophet, the message, the audience, the author, and the mystery. By the way, it's always good to see as you go through a book to see what are it's divided up, what is it exploring. And actually it has some great thing of who's the audience and who's the author and what's the message. In fact, whenever we read through scriptures, we should look for those specific things. But this actually splits up in this way. So let's look at the first one, the prophet. The prophet. So in verse 10 again, I'll read it again. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, make careful search and inquiries. Now this first part I want you to take note is concerning the salvation. Okay, remember, it's making note. What was the salvation he was talking about? Well, he's talking about 
what he talked about earlier about not just personal salvation, though that was indicated in it, but more than that, it was the preservation of the saints, sanctification, the new heavens and a new earth, and establishing of the kingdom of God. That this salvation is far more encompassing than just your own personal salvation, but the restoration and the uh, healing of all things and God making all things right at the end of the age. This is the salvation he's pointing to. Now, that when we keep, uh, and so what we want to do is we want, we want to keep our eyes on this. When we go through trials and tribulation, Peter keeps on pointing us back to God. He keeps on pointing us, pointing towards our heaven. Keep our eyes focused on the future. Keep our eyes focused on the salvation at the end of the age. Keep our eyes on focus on new heaven, new earth. Because as we go through trials and tribulation, that focus is key. And now as he goes into this next part, he's going to explain a little bit more how we can be certain of that to be happened. How can we have a confidence that this salvation will happen? And now instead of talking about the other errors we've talked about, he's now going to focus on God's revealing word as a source of our confidence of the things to come. He then goes on, Peter explains later on, he says, uh, salvation was not by surprise, but the prophets who prophesied of grace that would come to you. This is the key to understand all scripture. Moses and the prophets point to this point in history, coming of Messiah, the promised Messiah to come. They would always prophesy from the very beginning, starting in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when it said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, shall bruise your heel, and you shall bruise him on the head. There's a, there's a, this is a beginning hint of the seed. And actually, if you go through the Bible, from Genesis all the way to the New Testament, you'll keep on hearing the seed, the seed, the seed. And as we all see, the seed is a promised seed of Jesus. And so this is the thing. It starts right here. Does not take God by surprise. He knew exactly what was going to happen. And so right away, there's already a prophecy about the Messiah. Later on in Genesis 22, verse 18, he talks about how Abraham's seed would go into, it would be a blessing to the nation. And that the nation would be blessed and Abraham would multiply, but there would be a promised seed. It continues on, the seed would be going to Isaac and Jacob and then Judah, this promised seed of a Messiah, of a Redeemer. And in fact, Judah in Genesis 49, 10 would be called the scepter should not depart from you, the tribe of Judah. And so, so this is another sign that the, the, the Messiah would be from the tribe of Judah. This would be his kingdom. And then as we read through Moses, this when we hear about Moses delivering Israel from Egypt is a type of Christ that what Christ would do for us when he does the, the, uh, the Passover lamb and paint the blood on the doorpost. This is an echo of what Christ would do on the cross. And in fact, even the Day of Atonement itself is an image of one animal paying the price for many, what would Christ would do. Throughout the Old Testament, there's a point of there is a need for a Savior. Deuteronomy 18.15 then says, Yahweh, your God, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers, and you shall listen to him. At the end of Moses' life, when the Israelites are getting ready to go into promise land, one of the things he tells them, there will be a prophet that will come. Now, he's not talking the prophet of Elijah or Isaiah. This would be a special prophet. And in fact, when remember when the Pharisees came to John the Baptist to say, one of the things he asked you, are you the prophet? And he said, no. And when they said, are you the prophet? They're making this reference to this, pro this passage. Well, Jesus would be that prophet eventually. Uh, Another one, we can also look at Psalm 2, where we talked about 
Jesus coming to reign. But we also have Psalm 1, 110, verse 1, where it says, Yahweh says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies at the footstep for your feet. In fact, this is one of the verses that Jesus talks about. And he says, who is the Lord? Yahweh said to my Lord. And my Lord would have been, who is David's Lord other than Yahweh? And this would be Christ. It's a hint of that. Isaiah 9, uh, Isaiah 9, 6 says, For our child will be born to us and shall be given to us. The government will rest on shore. His name will be Wonderful Counselor, a Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And it goes on and on and on and on and on go through the scripture, this promise of a Messiah that would come to redeem him. And these prophecies were prophesied about this coming Messiah. And I think the most dramatic one is Daniel Daniel 7.13, where it talks about the, there's one like the Son of Man coming before the Ancient of Day, and that would be God, the Jesus, the Son of God, approaching the Ancient of Day, which would be God the Father. And so all of these verses, as Jesus would later say in Luke 24.7, he said, Moses and the prophets pointed to him. He explained, these are all were pointing to me. And it reminds us that, first of all, the Old Testament is very relevant to us. We dare not ignore it. It is a book that prophesied the Messiah. It explains why we need a Messiah. It gives us an understanding of our moral depravity. And the, the Old Testament is essential to understand the New Testament. If you take out the Old Testament, you lose the New Testament. You do not have a New Testament without Old Testament because the Old Testament explains the reason why we need a New Testament. And so it's essential, and this is important. And as Peter, uh, Paul would say in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, we'd say, all scriptures God breathed and profit for teaching, recruit, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thorough equipped for every good work. This all scripture... So the Old Testament is essential. Not only did the Old Testament prophecy prophesize about the grace to come, but they made a careful search and inquiries, he says, to when the grace of salvation were given. They were like the noble Bereans that Paul would interact in Acts 11, 10 through 11, where, remember, Paul had preached to them the gospel, and they went to their Bibles, and Yes, they would have went to their Old Testament and flipped to it and say, is, is Paul right? Is this Jesus really the Messiah? And they would make careful search. Well, these prophets of old didn't have a New Testament. In fact, some of them were, didn't know much. And so they, they hear echoes of this Messiah throughout the scripture, starting in Genesis, going to Deuteronomy, Isaiah, Psalm, and they hear about this guy. And they're trying to figure out who is this guy, when's this going to happen, when is the, the salvation of man going to happen, when will there be a redemption? And I beloved, it, I think there's an important lesson there. The important lesson is we need to study God's word. We need to study God's word. It is something we don't just do on Sunday, listen to the pastor. It is not something you just do, listen to the radio. It is not something you do by listening to songs on the radio. No, we need to read God's word for ourselves. And too often, unfortunately in Christianity, we read God's word through other people. We don't read God's word for what he says, but we want to hear what John MacArthur has to say, or we want to hear what Andrew Farley has to say, or we want to hear what uh, Robert Jeffries has to say about the scripture. No, what all these people would tell you is read the Bible for yourself. Study God's word for yourself, because this is God's word. No other person, there is no mediator other than God's word. So read God's word. Be like these prophets who study the scripture. And in it, you'll find a security, a promise, a hope of a salvation in Jesus Christ. But you will not get that if you go through a secondary mediator. Read God's word for yourself, and you'll be surprised how it nourishes you and pleases you and encourages you. So this is the first part, and I'm going to just move right on, which is now to the message. 
what is the message, and we kind of already mentioned the message, but let's continue on. Verse 11 says, inquiring, what do they want to inquire? Inquiring to know the time, what kind of time the Spirit of Christ within them was in a king as he was predicting the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. First, I want to point out something fun here, which is we see both the Spirit of Christ, which is the Holy Spirit, and the sufferings of Christ, which is talking about Jesus, the Son of God. And so here is one of these fun sections where you have the Holy Spirit talking about God the Son. And it's a great reminder that we have a triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all equally God, but all essentially one. We have a triune God, and it makes Christianity the most unique religion of all. No other religion has a triune God, and this triune God uh, uh, blesses one another, they praise one another, they love one another. In fact, one of the things that make Christianity one of the ones where God is love is because from the very beginning, before he made heavens or earth or any of us, he already had perfect loving relationship with himself between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So this is kind of a fine side, but it's nice. It's always important. When we see elements of the Trinity pop in the Bible, we should pay notice of it because it shows us a little something about who God was. But it goes on, and he says, second, he said, the prophecies were pointing to one important event, the death of Christ on the cross, the sufferings of Christ. That's what they were pointing to because that is the, the consequence of sin is death. Our sin deserves death. We deserve to die on the cross. We deserve to go to hell. That's what we deserve to do. But Christ steps into us and bears an atonement sacrifice and pays a price for our sins. And that is the, the mercies of God. He's, he's paying the price that we deserve and the grace of God that we receive his righteousness. And then you see the glories to follow. And the glories to follow is, is yes, sanctification of believers, the restoration of creation. Beloved, as you read through the scripture, this is a key to harmony to interpreting all scripture. This is what humanity we need to look at. The key is Christ crucified. As we go through the Old Testament, the New Testament, we must always keep our eyes focused on what it points to. Jesus Christ, crucifixion. And then what did it accomplish? Because if we just end there, we didn't receive anything. It's he died for us so we can be radically transformed into the image of Christ. That's why he did. And that is the key hermeneutic for reading the Bible. And when if we lose that, we lose everything. This is what is key. From the beginning of the Garden of Eden, this is what it points to. This also reminds us that Christianity is not a self-help religion. The whole point of the Bible is not to say how to have a good marriage, though it does do that. The whole point of the Bible is not to say how to, have, uh, how to be a good parent, but though it does that. The whole point of the Bible is this. And it's a very tempting thing to turn the Bible into a self-help book. The Bible is not a self-help book. It's a book about God and about the, the restoration of humanity through his son, Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. It's about God and what he did, not about us. Ultimately, it's about him. Here we see an insight about prophecy that though God leads godly men to write it. You notice these guys had prophesied and wrote these things and spoke these prophecy. You notice they don't fully understand it. And how do we know they don't fully understand it? Because they're inquiring, they're looking, they're studying. And there's something about when godly men speak, they follow God, they follow God where they lead. But sometimes it's not clear what he said. And, and this is, should not surprise us because when we go into the New Testament, remember John the Baptist? He first baptized Jesus. I got the Lamb of God and takes the sin in the world. And he was so confident. But later on, he's imprisoned by Herod, and later on, he's insane. Tells his disciples, go talk to that Jesus guy again. Make sure he really is the Messiah. And the reason was is Jesus wasn't matching up to the Messiah. He thought he was. He thought it was going to be a conquered Messiah. He thought it would be a Messiah that would take over 
uh, uh, take over Jerusalem and kick out the Romans. And, you know, often when uh, we read the scriptures, there's some things uh, that were not clear. And one of the things I always tell people is, if it's not clear, if the Bible did not clear state it, then let it be. Too often we try to start saying, we want to find out an answer to the answer to a question. And this is how you end up with some people say, how many angels can you get on a tip of a pencil? What a ridiculous question. But often, because we just can't let it be, we can't just let there be a mystery we always go looking for answers. And this is why I, I think there's a danger because people are, can be rather certain about the end times. I'm not saying that won't happen. I'm not saying that Jesus won't come back again. But we must be careful when there is different people with different opinions and often we'll get in fight and we'll divide the body over tertiary things, over third things that are not essential. These are not things that will separate people's salvation, but we'll divide church over it. And remember, there are things like the coming of Christ that was unclear to them, and there might be some stuff that won't be clear to us. And so sometimes it will only become clear when God makes it clear. I truly believe that I do not know, know exactly how the end times will be revealed, but I guarantee when he does come back, we're going to be like, oh, that's how it happened. And it's going to blow our minds. We're like, oh, I thought it was going to work that way. And it turned out to be that way. And, and I thought this and that. And, and so to some degree, there's things we're going to look into. And we should look into. We should study. We should try to understand. But when there's a mystery, let the mystery stand and trust God that he's sovereign over it. The, the next thing is the audience. The audience. And we thought we knew the audience. It would be the prophets, right? And the prophets are talking to their audience. But actually, what Peter indicates is the audience was actually someone else. And let's look at the first part of verse 12. It says, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. They were not serving themselves, but you. That these prophets of old were writing these down, writing this prophecy so that you may be certain that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. You see, what, as, as they wrote this stuff down, they were unclear, they were uncertain, they didn't know what it mean. It only became clear when Jesus appeared. It even became more clear when, uh, after the death, burial, resurrection, and after they received and dwelling of uh, the Holy Spirit. That's when it finally became clear, and these passages all of a sudden made sense. And um, if you ask some people, they'll read the Bible, and if they're not a believer, they won't get the connection, they won't see. But once you understand the gospel, and once you understand who Jesus is, you start flipping to the Old Testament, and you can't help but bump into Jesus. You can't help but bump into the Messiah. It's everywhere. It's the, the, the types of Christ, the image of Christ, the, the prophecy, they're everywhere. But it's only from a New Testament perspective that you can understand that. And he said, this was written to you so you can have confidence that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That he is God incarnate. It gives you that confidence so that you do not question whether you have salvation or not. Because they have written so you will have confidence in your faith. That is why they wrote it to you. The author, and this is the most important, who is a true author? Because we think it's the prophets, and to one degree, yes, God works through men. But an ultimate sense, the author is God. It says this in the second part, of verse 12, in these things, which now you have been declared to you through those who proclaim the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven. Here, Peter reveals to us the true author of Scripture. The true author of Scripture is the Holy Spirit. The true author of Scripture is God speaking through man, inspiring them to write his word. As Second Peter 1, 20-21 would eventually write, he says, now, these, now know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture come by one's own interpretation, 
For no prophecy was ever made by the will of man, but men being moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. God is breathing his word into man. He is illuminating the scripture. He's revealing the scripture, and these people pen the scripture. This is God's word from front to back. Genesis to Revelation, don't question it. It is God's word because it was written and penned by God. We, we do not say we're going to pick and choose parts of the Bible because there is no pick and choose in parts of the Bible because it's all God's word. From beginning to end, it is his word. And our biggest thing we need to do is search the scripture and pray. How, how often do you take the time to pray before you read your Bible? Because it's the Holy Spirit. See, it says, for all that, no prophecy comes by one's own interpretation. In other words, if we want to know what Scripture needs to do, we need to ask for the Holy Spirit to enlighten us, to give us, reveal our understanding. It's the Holy Spirit that brings us. So I would encourage you, as you read your Bible, before you read it, just start and say, God, I pray that as we read your God's word today, that you reveal your truth so we can have an understanding of the truth of your word. Pray before you, leave, to, before you read your Bible, because only God can truly reveal all the, the details and nuances. Yes, I, I spend my, uh, some time on Monday reading through my Bible commentaries, trying to get some information, but in the end, on Sunday morning, I am in prayer because I said, oh, let's put that all aside. That's all God. Now, now I just want to bring this to God in prayer for this sermon. Because in the end, this has to be your sermon. This needs to be your word. And we want to preach your word. And we want to understand your word. So when you approach the scriptures, approach it to it in prayer. And you'll be amazed how God illuminates the scriptures. Um, I tell you the truth, that beloved, if you want to hear God's voice, a lot of people are always looking for that book. There's always a book, Hear God's Voice. This is the key to hearing God's verse, voice. You don't have to do no trick. There's no trick or all. Just open God's word, and you can hear his voice speak. As the author of Hebrews says in 4.12, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as a vision of soul and spirit, both joints and marrows, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the hearts. This word is alive. Um, I, and it will, you'll be surprised how sometimes you'll read it and like, ouch. And then you'll be like, God, forgive me for I have sinned. Other times you'll be like, oh, praise the Lord. That's, that's what my heart needed to hear. There's, it, it speaks to your heart, and he cuts to our hearts because it's his word, and it still speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. And so read God's word. To know God's will for your life, there's a, there is no great mystery to knowing God's will for life. It's right here. Almost the God's word is sufficient, is sufficient. I want to say again, it is sufficient for all things, for faith and practice. If you want to know how to live your life, how to live a guy life, how to live a life that gives honor and praise to God, if you want to know about salvation and forgiveness and mercy and how to love your neighbors, it is in here and God speaks. Finally, the mystery. This mystery. I don't know if you caught it at the very end. There's a mystery, and it's this. Things to which the angels long to look. And there's a reason why I said long to look, and we'll see it. There's a mystery, this grace, this salvation, which is declared by God's word, and which the angels help to bring forth, is something they don't understand. I'm going to say, the, the gospel, even though they're instrumental, 
even they were important aspects, even though they declare the birth of Christ, they fully don't fully understand what's going on here because they have, do not have that. They don't have a salvation story. The, 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 and, and Jesus came to die for us and not for angels. And so they, they're, they're, they're not, they're, they're, just, they're like, what is this? And why is God doing this? Why would God do that for them? I don't know. <laughs> and there is no salvation for fallen angels as you read through the Bible. There's no salvation for them. And the angels that didn't fall, they're perfect servants of God and they give praise to God. So the, the angels of heaven, they don't need a, a gospel story. And the ones of hell, they're, well, they're fallen. They're never going to return. They're rebellious. And so this idea of redemption, of forgiveness of sins, being restored, is something they will never fully understand. Isn't it amazing that there is a mystery that the angels long to understand that we have experience because we have experienced the forgiveness of God that we have received the Holy Spirit dwelling in us that there's something about this, this amazing thing that the angels long to understand and, and this word long to look is actually a, a, a phrase that means to kind of look over so you can imagine the angels looking over down at earth like what is going on down there god what are you doing down there why are i and they're just and, and and they're amazed and they're getting praise to god and this this thing is what we have received you know one thing we forget that right now we we are made a little lower than the angels but now we have become adopted as sons and daughters of God and that one day we'll receive a new glorified body not only that but one day we will actually be the ones judging the angels is that and, and it talks about first Corinthians 6 is that crazy that there is something that God is going to elevate us into a status that we do not deserve and it's going to be a bigger praise to God and, and, and this is something the scriptures have talked about and encouraged and lifted us up. And this is the truth. And it's something that the prophets looked into, these angels looked into. In this world, we will experience trials and tribulations. The whole point of 1 Peter is about this. They're going through trials and tribulation in Turkey. And in those times of trials and testing, is our it one of the things it tests our trust and our fidelity to God's word are we going to hold close to it and when the world says that's wrong and that's bigoted will we cling to us and no this is God's word this is my savior this is his word and I will trust in it I don't care what the world will say because his word will stand because it is a rock in which I stand and so the, the time of testing comes and you hold on to God's word and God's word tells you about the Messiah. God's word tells you about the salvation that awaits you. God's word tells you about, about your peace and mercy and grace you have in Jesus Christ. And so this is about God's word and how God's word gives us security. And one of the things that gives you more security than anything is when I say, okay, I'm going to do it God's way. And I do it God's way. I follow God's word. He says, do this, I do this. And I see, wow, that worked out. God does know better. If I would have done it the world's way, it would have been worse. And it's interesting how every time I do with God's word, it shows his faithful and truth. And so that is what we should do. We should be like the prophets and the angels and Moses longed to look in God's word and meditate on God's word. Like in Psalm 1. Oh, I love Psalm 1. How he says, I meditate on your word day and night. And he's like a tree planted. May we 
meditate on God's word, when we soak up God's word, may it transform us from the inside out through the Holy Spirit, through the sanctification, through Jesus' finished work on the cross, and may it give us strength and courage as you move forward to trials and tribulation. And let me finish off with, may you be filled with the hope and the promise of God's word. If you like these videos, please like, share, subscribe, and ring that bell. God bless you, and have a good day. Thank you.